Um, I'm Andrew Norton. I'm director of IIED, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you. A uh, particular pleasure because we've got some of the audience here in person, IRL in real life, which is great. Um, and yeah, this is the first event I think we've done with the, with ICAI, with yeah. the Independent Commission for Aid Impact. So that's also um, a real first for us, and we're delighted to be here. Um, I also want to say a special welcome to our virtual audience, almost 200 people registered to join us online, and we're really delighted that we can extend this discussion to people all over the world. That's been one of the real pluses of lockdown is learning to do that and learning how easy it is to do that. Um, thank you for being part of the discussion today, both the people here and the people online, and for those of you online, please um, leave your comments in the chat box and questions in the Q&A panel. You're in the safe hands of my colleague Georgina Diaz, who is in the Zoom room and will support the online participation. So welcome to the online audience. Um, this is our first fully hybrid event, so we'd appreciate your patience if we need to iron out any technical glitches as we go through, but very much looking forward to it. Um, please note, we are recording this event and it's on the record, not under Chatham House Rule. So a few words just to set the scene. Um, we're talking about aligning aid with the Paris Agreement with a focus on the UK's official development assistance. Um, the IPCC report, the uh, well, the two parts of uh, AR6, Assessment Report 6, um, have both reaffirmed how incredibly urgent the need is to strengthen action on climate change in all its dimensions, in all ways. Indigenous peoples, those living in informal settlements, pastoralists, smallholder farmers, citizens of small island states are all on the front line of the negative impacts. And these will ramp up dramatically, uh, certainly if warming exceeds the more ambitious Paris target of 1.5 degrees of anthropogenic warming over pre-industrial. So it is worth saying a little bit, just a about those two reports, Working Group 1 on the science and Working Group 2 on the human impacts um, and adaptation. Um, perhaps the report on the science is particularly in the news. I'm sure many of you will have seen the reports on the extraordinary temperature and anomalies in the poles, um, which have been picked up, um, which are really incredible and off the scale. And of course, that will have reverberating impacts around the world. So increasingly, it looks as if impacts are stronger for every fraction of warming, uh, certainly than the scientific community had hoped three or four years ago. And Working Group 2 outlines the implications for people around the world, and particularly um, those who did least to create the climate crisis in the poorest countries. Um, and again, it's a very striking report, and I recommend you all to look at it if you haven't yet. And climate finance, of course, is a key part of the picture. It will be needed on a scale that can meaningfully help people to build resilience and to adapt, as well as to help uh, countries to take forward their own ambitions for mitigation. We work a lot with the Least Developed Countries group, and they are very passionate about mitigation as well as about adaptation, and they want to play their own role in being part of the solution in that area as well. Um, and it's fair to say that the spotlight has been on UK aid around this, particularly following the budget cuts in official development assistance, and also COP26 hosted by the UK, um, which was, well, I think on that, the UK did a really good job of delivering uh, something functional under incredibly challenging circumstances. So congratulations to the team that did that. And we're all still waiting for the UK's international development strategy, which um, has been expected for a while, and we hope will be out soon and is referenced in this report as a key recommendation um, to um, sort of drive forward alliance with the Paris Agreement in UK aid. So it's a good moment to have this discussion now. Um, and this is very important for IAD as well. Uh, a few personal words, as I mentioned, we've worked with the least developed countries for over 20 years in the climate negotiations. And we also have a deep commitment um, 
in relation to climate finance and to aid to delivering money where it matters in relation to climate finance, reaching communities on the, on the front line for adaptation, for loss and damage and for mitigation. So we're here today to explore what progress has been made on this agenda, where the opportunities and barriers are, and what the implications are for developing countries, climate resilience and adaptation in this agenda about aligning aid with the Paris Agreement. Um, let me now introduce the panel. Um, we're delighted to be joined by Tamsin Barton, the Chief Commissioner of the Independent Commission for Aid Impact, the organisation that led this rapid view of UK aid alignment with the Paris Agreement. And Tamsin is going to introduce the report and give us the top lines from that report um, and also the key recommendations that are um, contained within it. Then we're really delighted to have Val Nanandram with us, Climate and Environment Director at FCDO. Thanks very much for joining us, Val. It's great to have you here, um, who we hope can share insights into the progress and priorities on this agenda, and also say a few words, insofar as it's possible, about the upcoming international development strategy. And we have joining us online, uh, we're delighted to have Dr. Kevin Karayuki. Dr. Karayuki is the Vice President for Power, Energy, Climate and Green Growth at the African Development Bank Group. He's a chartered electrical engineer with over 30 years of experience in climate change and green growth, strategic energy partnerships, energy financial solutions, policy and regulation. So it's really important, I think, to have the perspective of a multilateral development bank working on this agenda and how they see um, the, the Paris Agreement alignment with development aid, how they see that agenda. And thank you so much, Dr. Karayuki, for joining us. Um, my colleague, Claire Shakir, who's the director of the climate group at IID, has sadly had to pull out, she's not well. But we're delighted to have a fantastic deputy, IID's Ebony Holland um, with us. And thanks very much for stepping in at short notice, Ebony. Um, Ebony has led um, our work at IID throughout the super year of the two COPs, the UNFCCC, COP26, um, and the yet to happen uh, Convention on Bio Biodiversity, CBD15 in Kunming, still upcoming. Um, and Ebony has specialised particularly on how to link those agendas through nature-based solutions to the climate crisis that also protect the planet's precious biodiversity. And a particular area of interest for Ebony as for IID is the role that climate finance can play in creating inclusive and equitable delivery mechanisms uh, that enable communities at the front line to determine their own actions for poverty, um, for climate and for the nature loss crisis as well. And we're looking forward to hearing Ebony's perspective on aid and insights into climate and biodiversity finance more generally. So to kick us off, I'd like to hand over to Tamsin to share what the ICAI rapid review tells us about the UK's progress on aligning aid with the Paris Agreement and what were the key recommendations and how should they be prioritised? Thank you, Tamsin. Well, thanks very much, Andy. It's absolutely brilliant to have this first of ICAI plus IIED. And it's really exciting for us to have our first hybrid event. We hope this is going to be the best of both worlds. I mean, we wouldn't be able to have Dr. Karyuki, and I'm sure you'll all agree that that is really going to add a lot to our discussions today. On the other hand, those of you who are here in person are going to enjoy once again that informal exchange, which is so important for our, our collaboration in future. So really, really glad to be here and to have such wonderful fellow panellists. So let me tell you a bit about our report. And I want to just go back to the context that Andy was talking about, uh, which is the IPCC report. I think it's been pretty hard to hear the message of that report through all the noise of these turbulent times that we're, we're living in. But I know that those of you online and those of you here will have been listening and you all heard that clear message that any delay and we're gonna miss that rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. Unfortunately, that launch was of course overshadowed by the Russia-Ukraine crisis. But that crisis does actually shine a light on those important 
there's dangerous, if you like, dependencies that we have, the dependence on fossil fuels. And the, and this, the Russia-Ukraine crisis should actually accelerate our urgency in addressing climate change and sustainability. The implications for food security and vulnerability to climate change are still emerging. So more than ever, from that climate perspective, there's the need for a just transition to renewable energy rather than a reversion to fossil fuels. So it's against this backdrop that we look at the context where the world is falling well short of delivering the amount of finance necessary. And of course, at Glasgow, uh, I'm sure most of you will have noted that the Glasgow Climate Pact noted with deep regret the developed countries missing the hundred billion dollar goal by 2020. That's important. But what we're looking at here is not just the failure to scale up climate finance, uh, but the really important scaling down of finance flows that continue to support inconsistent actions with the climate agreement, with the Paris Climate Agreement. What's embedded in that agreement and what we're looking at today is, ma is making finance flows consistent with low emission, climate resilient development pathways. So the UK actually made a commitment that its official development assistance would be aligned uh, with the Paris Agreement in this respect back in June 2019. At that time, most of the focus was the context of the UK's green finance strategy, positioning the UK uh, as an important centre of green finance. But for those looking at official development assistance, this commitment did not go unnoticed. And it was exactly uh, that commitment that got us in ICAI thinking, what can we do? Because our job is to scrutinize official development assistance provided by the UK. We try and help the parliamentary committee in that process uh, and to, to provide the information so that the government can be held to account. Whenever it makes a commitment on anything, then that makes our ears prick up and we think maybe this is something we need to do a report on. So that was the background to us deciding to do this uh, review. We made it a rapid review. And the reason for that was that we wanted to look at it early. Uh, we, we, so we just focused really on the relevance and coherence of the approach. We recognized that it was early days to look at effectiveness uh, in a shift such as this, which really requires a lot of change. So what did we find? We found that this was a really important commitment made. It actually mattered. But that in the context of the urgency we've just been talking about, a much more ambitious approach and acceleration of action was needed to reflect the scale and importance of the task ahead. It did take a very long time from that commitment being made in June 2019 to bring in the tools into play. So it took until March 2021 for the fossil fuel policy to be brought in and then for all the tools to apply to new business cases in the FCDO, it took until April 2021, a point at which actually not many new business cases were coming in because, again, as mentioned by Andy, uh, we'd seen a process of reducing budgets and therefore fewer new projects coming through. So we said that was slow. Having said that, focusing on what is being done, we generally thought that the tools brought in do reflect emerging best practice. And there isn't as yet a sort of canon of best practice on how to do this. So the four tools that the FCDO is using are the climate risk assessment, shadow carbon pricing, the fossil fuel policy, as mentioned, and alignment with country partners' own climate mitigation and adaptation plans. So on the fossil fuel policy, it was clear that that was something there was, a, there was a lot. I'm sure some of you were involved in those consultations. And there was a lot of consultation across the government, uh, which wasn't the case for all the tools. But one of the things that worried us about these tools, even though they were good, is there did seem to be too many exemptions or caveats to them so that they, they aren't as mandatory as they might appear to be. And that's a journey we want to see the government going on. We can understand not everything can be done right away, 
but we want to see progress from where we are at the moment. So if you take one of these tools, the shadow carbon price, it is complicated, it's resource intensive. We understand that they, you know, there might not be a requirement to do it everywhere, but 70% of programs not doing it, that does begin to raise questions as to the extent to which it's really going to prove a tool for change. Another very striking feature, feature in terms of the materiality is so much of UK aid is going through either multilateral channels or increasingly through British international investment, uh, which until I think it's April the 1st, uh, or perhaps it's the 6th, uh, is still CDC, but I'm trying to adjust to that name, so I'm sure you, you all are already. And, and the, UK, the UK has to rely on those uh, institutions' own efforts and their own definitions and their own tools. Uh, so we are wondering what, what the plan is really in relation to how that will change. Uh, so we do think that these tools, well, they, they do reflect good practice in screening out, but there, there remains the question about positive selection, purposefully directing projects in, in that direction of low emission climate resilient development in all aid, uh, not just in climate finance. And particularly, we think that's important because it could be seen as very much a northern agenda, a conditionality by donors, if you like, on aid, limiting the options available to developing country partners. Uh, and, and we all know why that wouldn't be fair. So I guess one of the things that worried us most when we looked at what was happening was that the responsibility for this commitment, it was taken for the whole of government, but actually really we could only see two departments focused on it, FCDO, uh, and we have VEL today, and BASE, the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, which was very engaged in some areas like that uh, carbon pricing. It had to be said that from our interviews with other departments, it wasn't, wasn't clear the extent to which they felt committed to the agenda. So that, that was a worry for us. And we could see that the lines of reporting weren't clear. You know, if there's a commitment, you need to have some process by which somebody is telling somebody we've achieved X or Y, which is moving us towards that. So that was one of the other things that, that bothered us. And then something that's important to those of you working in, in civil society in particular, transparency about the metrics. How will it be clear? How will it be visible whether the commitments are being followed and what are the metrics for it? That's something that we're hoping to see in particular in, in the international development strategy once it appeared. And then a third, a third very key issue, uh, which has perhaps grown um, since the merger between FCO and DFID, although there may be opportunities in that merger because in the run-up to COP, there were so many people engaged in the climate agenda, there is valuable capacity there. So we raised questions based on what we heard from our interviewees about whether there's really enough capacity of the sufficient expertise and capability to apply all these complicated tools across all the programs. We could certainly see when we were talking to the overseas network that they, they were worried as to how they were going to be able to do it with limited capacity. And remember, there's been a commitment to double climate finance. So that's already asking twice as much to be done from these experts. And now they're also meant to be looking at all of aid and ensure that it's Paris aligned. So that does, it does set an ambitious agenda for building capacity and capability. Last but not least, and I'm particularly looking forward to hearing from Dr. Kariuki on this, but we found that the UK had effectively influenced the multilateral development banks. It would be really good to hear the extent to which that coincided with an agenda within them. Um, and I won't spoil what, what comes out in our report looking at IDA, uh, on the World Bank, but we felt in this review we could see definite influence there. Having said that, this, that still doesn't mean that everything uh, that the UK wanted was achieved, because if you take lending through multilaterals, as with British international investment, if that lending is indirect, going through intermediaries, there doesn't at the moment seem to be any way of ensuring that that's Paris aligned, so there's an agenda there. So what next? That's the question for today. How far Will the UK go? UK is still the COP president until Egypt takes over later this year. Uh, UK is, is still a leader. 
uh, in providing finance to support developing countries to respond and adapt. And it's taken on this commitment. So this commitment we feel is one of the areas that's really going to be a test of credibility in this year with the UK as leader. International eyes are going to be on the UK. So we were interested to read what the government's response was. You're going to hear the latest response uh, from Vell in a minute, but the official response that's gone to the committee, uh, the government said it's working to progress time-bound milestones for the Paris alignment across all ODA spending departments. So this is we, what we want to know is whether that's actually happening, and we hope it's been happening through the process of developing the international development strategy, which we hope is uh, imminently going to be out. It, for us, the most important thing is the milestones on that journey so that there is some kind of accountability and openness to scrutiny on whether this commitment is being kept to or not. That's the first thing. Second thing the government has said is there's more we can do across government to accelerate implementation of this commitment within established accountability structures. They naturally resisted any suggestion that accountability arrangements could be changed. Each minister is responsible for their own department. We, we know that, we accept that, but we still think there's more they can do. So interested to hear about that. Last, third, uh, this learning and development effort, the capacity and capability. So the government said they're developing a broader learning and development offer for all officials to embed Paris alignment approaches in HMG's, Her Majesty's government's international work. We think that will be critical to ensure the UK's alignment goals are, pu are pursued across all aid programming. And it's not just a ring fenced climate issue. So that's what our report has put the focus on. Looking forward to all the speakers, but hopefully I've provided a good introduction to what Vel is going to say to provide all the latest answers to all those pointed questions from ICAI. Thank you. Thank you, Tamsin. Um, a really fantastic introduction. Um, really great to hear the ICAI focus on accountability. Um, milestones, benchmarks, also this question of the strategic approach. When, you know, when do we see that? Because obviously a lot of these questions depend on that. Um, and also around capacity and instruments as well. So a really fascinating introduction. Bell. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, uh, and thank you to Tamsin and Aikai for the, for the report. I think we accepted or partially accepted all of your recommendations. So, you know, it is just in the spirit of Aikai kind of, also not just holding us to account, but helping us improve, you know, thank you, Tamsin, you and the team, um, and also IIED for, for hosting this event, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say two points up front, and Tamsin, you, you kind of mentioned some of the current contextual things, and I, I just wanted to pick up on two of those, really. The first is to kind of just recognise we're having this event in the midst of a global crisis, um, and that's, that's obvious, it's shaping geopolitics, partnerships, political bandwidth, um, and uh, yeah, as I say, you know, we all know that, but it's important to kind of recognize that here, because when we talk about Paris alignment, we're not doing that in a vacuum, we're doing it in a constantly shifting global context, right, and that shapes the art of the possible, both positively and negatively, and I'll try and say a, say a bit about that, but I think it is, it's really worth kind of saying that global context is important for these conversations. Um, and then the second, again, Tamsin, picking up your point, there is no agreed international definition for Paris alignment. We are sort of collectively as an international community and in the private sector, everybody is trying to evolve what's possible, what the, art, what, what the kind of policy trade-offs are in some of these issues. And there are trade-offs and, and Tamsin um, alluded to some. So, um, yeah, I just want to say there's no kind of fixed benchmark to which we can hold ourselves. We're all trying to get to the same journey together. Um, so so um, let me just say a bit about those, the four tools that we're using and kind of how we're thinking about evolving them. The first is the fossil fuels policy. Um, so this came out, as, as Tamsin said, uh, March last year now. Um, so we've had a bit of time to see how this is you know, the choices that surfacing, whether that's in the MDB boards, in domestic um, support packages and so on. So we're seeing, you know, some of those choices surfacing up. Um, uh, I would say kind of going forward, obviously, um, and Tamsin, you alluded to this, the, the Russia-Ukraine crisis is putting a new prism on energy. 
And I think it's helpful, Ned, and the Prime Minister put out an uh, op-ed last week, I think, where he really kind of framed the um, energy response here about accelerating and turbocharging the transition to renewables. You know, this isn't just about 1.5 anymore. It's also about energy independence and reducing reliance on other countries. And I think, um, you know, that that is going to accelerate some of these conversations. Um, and I'm happy to kind of go into a bit more of that in, in the Q&A. Um, the second tool is carbon pricing. Um, and absolutely, we have at the moment focused the application of a shadow carbon price on the highest emitting sectors in the highest emitting countries. So we have exempted fragile states, for example, from the application of a shadow carbon price. And, you know, we've been doing this uh, coming up for a year now. And what we want to do is to really learn how teams are implementing these shadow carbon prices and what impact that's having on choices. What we absolutely don't want to do, and very much as the ICAI report highlighted is get to a place where the application of Paris alignment tools limits development choices. And so we need to be kind of quite measured in how we roll out some of these tools so that we don't create perverse kind of effects. Um, so absolutely, we're committed to continually kind of raising the bar on that, but we want to do that in a really measured way where we're understanding the implications of each of those kind of tools. So anyway, direction of travel very much in the spirit of trying to extend um, carbon pricing. The third tool we have is around alignment with national climate plans. So whether that's the NDCs or the national adaptation plans, we want to make sure development programming is aligned to climate plans. Um, and there's, there's, of course, a sort of, you know, that just makes obvious sense at one level, I guess. But there is, a, and I think this is highlighted in the ICA report, but that's not enough, right? We know that the current set of NDCs don't get us to the temperature goal that we need to get to. Um, even if you were to take into account ambitious um, long net, net zero targets for the you know, 2050s and beyond, you get at most optimistic 1.8 degrees. So we know we need to push NDCs further. So, um, and the Glasgow Climate Pact gives us the ratchet this year, right? We have the ratchet opportunity this year to drive further ambition in NDC. So I just wanted to elevate the kind of our approach on the NDC tool. It's not just about making sure that, you know, in-country development programming is aligned to national plans. It's also about raising ambition in those plans, uh, whether that's the NDC or the NAP, I should say. Um, and... Uh, a big, big push this year is going to be on um, the Clean and Green Initiative, which was launched by the G7 last year. Um, and sort of the flagship was the South African Just Energy Transition Partnership that was launched at Glasgow, which is about kind of the international community coming together around countries' energy transition plans. Um, and we want to kind of see that piloted in a few more countries this year. So that just goes to the point about trying to have positive investments that, that Tamsin was um, mentioning there. Um, the fourth tool is climate risk assurance. Um, so, and I think working group two, I mean, I mean, that is a hard read. I think anyone, you know, who's working in development has to be thinking about the climate science and how you're future proofing our development interventions. I think, and I'll come to this in a second, the, the capability to kind of translate climate science into implications for your development programming is not straightforward. That's something, you know, it's not easy to do. Um, we have teams of people kind of working on that on both sides of that, but it's a journey that we're on and we need to kind of get to a point where it is easier to make that connection between the science and the impacts. Um, so those are the four tools. Let me quickly just say something about some of the other areas we're thinking about. Firstly, international engagement, at the same time as kind of doing our own sort of internal policies, we are continuing to push the international system, including our colleagues in the MDBs um, and in all of our kind of um, that the, any funding arrangement we have with other partners, we're try, trying to continue to push um, Paris alignment there. I would also just flag that it's not just about Paris alignment, it's about nature um, and nature proofing and nature positive. So, if, Andy, you mentioned CBD COP coming up. Um, so Kunming and the Global Biodiversity Framework, how we make sure ODA is also aligned to that is another big event this year. Um, Sorry, and then I was just going to say some of the challenges. I can see you've got a time. I just had a note that Dr. Kariuki needs to leave oh, shortly. Is let me stop. I was, yeah, yeah. Right yeah. to him for a moment. Yeah, no apologies for that. Dr. Kariuki, we're delighted to have you with us. Um, please do go ahead. Um, with a, I think a key thing here is also to get a sense of um, how the African Development Bank sees the Paris Alignment Agenda. Um, having had, if you like, um, 
engagement in this area actually since um, for quite a while, since 2017. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew, for the floor. Uh, I would like to, first of all, uh, thank IIED and OIKAI for inviting the African Development Bank to this event and share perspectives and insights on how we are working with our client countries for Paris alignment goals, Paris agreement goals. Accordingly, let me start with the development during the last year, which make 2021 a watershed year for alignment of our operations with the Paris alignment goals. This is because the developments I'm going to talk about create an enabling environment that will facilitate Paris alignment. Firstly, in October 2021, the bank approved an addendum to, to formally preclude new coal investments uh, henceforth. Simultaneously, the board also approved new climate change and green growth, uh, growth policy and strategy for the period 2021 to 2030. These provide a framework for operationalizing the Paris alignment goals within two specific timeframes. Firstly, full alignment with building blocks on mitigation, adaptation, and climate finance by COP by December 2023. And secondly, full alignment with the remaining building blocks, that is on, on, on country or client level alignment, joint reporting, and internal alignment by December 2025. These developments will underpin all bank operations and activities in respect of party alignment. Accordingly, the bank is developing a detailed roadmap and action plan to fully operationalize party alignment across the board based on change management principles to ensure that we carry everyone along. Specifically regarding our, our client countries, or regional member countries or RMS, RMCs, as we refer to them, the alignment to the goals of the Paris Agreement is fundamental to our collective goal of zero net, uh, net zero emissions and climate resilient development. Hence, the need to review the progress of RMC, RMCs in the Paris Alignment journey and the role of the bank it's playing is important. Starting with uh, COP26 recommendation, that all countries are required to submit their new or updated NDCs, LTS and, and adaptation plans ahead of COP27, which is only eight months away, it is noteworthy that whereas all the 54 African countries have submitted their first NDCs, 39 have submitted revised or updated NDCs, but a mere three have submitted long-term strategies although Nigeria has established a long-term vision. While only eight countries have submitted their national adaptation plans. This performance is largely due to limited capacity to develop adaptation measures and adequate, inadequate systems to collect, analyze, and predict adaptation impact scenarios. These capacity gaps need to be bridged urgently to enable countries to comprehensively uh, communicate their strategies, targets, priorities, as well as mitigation and, ad and adaptation needs in a timely manner through these instruments, that is NDCs, NAPs, and LTSs, with a view to accessing climate finance for the accelerated transitioning to low greenhouse gas emission, uh, climate resilient and sustainable development economic uh, pathways. This is why our new climate change and green growth policy and strategy not only makes a concrete commitment to support African countries to formulate these plans, but also provides a clear blueprint for the actualizing their national party agreement commitments. It is in this context that the bank has really developed a, 20, or a 21 million proposal to support African countries fast track their party agreement commitments in line with the Glasgow Climate Pact outcomes. This proposal builds on our experience in supporting NDC development in countries such as Uganda, Sao Tome and Princip, Namibia, Liberia, and Cameroon. The outcomes from this effort will also inform collection of data and preparation of technical assessment 
component ahead of COP20, uh, sorry, of 2023, Pari Agreement Global Stocktake under the UNFCCC on climate change. Moreover, the bank is currently developing a robust monitoring, evaluation, reporting, and learning system, which will serve as a results-based reporting and accountability framework of its party alignment objectives. This framework aims to ensure adequate reporting and accountability of all our climate actions, including our intervention to help African countries to enhance their ambitions and commitments to, towards implement, implementing the Paris Agreement. The foregoing is additional to the work of the bank in hosting and coordinating the Africa NDC Hub, which is a collaborative platform of 21 partner institutions, including IIED, uh, your organization, Andrew, UN agencies, UNEP, UNECA, UNFCCC, FAO, WWF, to name but a few, all supporting African countries in the delivery of their party uh, commitments and foster long-term climate actions. Through the African NDC Hub, the bank hopes to leverage partner institutions to scale up delivery of party commitments and raise ambition of our regional member countries. Finally, the bank has selected climate change as one of the focus areas in the Africa Development Fund replenishment process that is just starting. As one of our most important tools for mobilizing resources at scale, ADF presents a tremendous opportunity to support the efforts by African countries to enhance their climate ambitions under the Paris Agreement. From the foregoing, I am sure that you appreciate the bank's endeavors and indeed challenges to foster alignment to the Paris Agreement. We therefore welcome the international communities to join hands and support the bank in building the requisite enabling environment and capacity at country level to ensure a timely realization of the Paris Agreement. Just uh, very, very briefly uh, regarding the uh, one of the questions that was raised on how uh, we have performed, I want to say that uh, um, um, through UK, you can say through UK uh, shareholding, uh, as a shareholder, 40% uh, of bank approvals uh, to date are uh, committed to, cl as, uh, are classified as climate finance, including over 50%, actually 67% in 2021 as ad adaptation. I think you'll be pleased to note that uh, the African Development Bank is the only MDB that has actually exceeded parity between uh, clim uh, climate mitigation and adaptation uh, finance. I think I'll stop there and I thank you very much. Dr. Kariuki, thank you so much. That was really, um, really valuable contribution and great to hear um, and really emphasizes a special role for the African Development Bank in supporting African countries to lead on this agenda, to lead on the Paris Alignment agenda. So thank you so much for joining us and also Many thanks to the African Development Bank for your leadership as well on the adaptation finance agenda, which has been um, incredibly important. Dr. Kariuki, I think you have to lead, leave us soon, but I understand one of your colleagues will be joining us for the Q&A. Yes, I'm actually very sorry. Actually, my driver is actually he's already started the engine because we are supposed <laughs> to be heading to the airport. So uh, Alamdu is actually a sector, uh, sorry, um, subject matter expert, so he will be more than an able deputy to deputize me in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Yes, I hope you don't miss your flight, for sure. But it's wonderful. Thank you very much. You. Thank you so much, Dr. Karen. Bye-bye. Um, well, <laughs> you uh, no, I, really, you I can't any, really be um, there. Um, I just, I guess, if I may, just one sure. last point, picking up on something Tamsin said, which is um, about capacity and capability to do this stuff, and just to really yeah. sort of hear that and say we have heard it, and I recognise it's a challenge because this stuff is not easy. So we are investing quite heavily in how we build, particularly capability. So you know, with the people we have, how do we build up their ability to do this stuff? Um, I'll stop there. Okay, look, thank you very much indeed, Val. Um, it's great to have that response, and I'm sure there are a lot of points that people will come back to, um, but also really good to hear about how this agenda is moving forward within FCDO. So thank you very much indeed. And uh, the last panelist is Ebony. 
Um, so, Ebony, we were, I think a number of questions in your area. Um, it'd be great if you could reflect on what you've heard from the panelists and how it links to broader climate finance issues. How can we raise the ambition level and what do donors need to do beyond alignment? Is that a transformational enough goal? Thank you, Emma. Thanks, Andy, for that very simple question. Um, everyone, it's a really great pleasure to be here, both for the folks dialing in virtually and also for everyone here in the room. It's fantastic to be back in person. Um, and also my pleasure to be here on behalf of Claire, who was very sad to miss this, um, but hopefully I can, I can step in adequately for her. Um, I've got two points to make in relation to this question, Andy, but the first point I want to make and really reinforce is that what we're talking about here, which is aligning ODA with the goals of the Paris Agreement, is no small task. It's a really big task, um, and I think all panellists so far have touched on that. Um, and it's important that we don't treat this as an issue that we can just kind of tweak around the edges, and that's fine. Actually, what we're talking about in some ways is really looking at the design or even redesign of the development system as a whole. And so I think it's really important that we bear that in mind, and, and we've all kind of touched on the journey that this needs to go on over time and I think starting that journey and what the UK is doing is really fantastic so far. Um, I do also think that the upcoming international development strategy is a really critical lever for achieving this, for bringing closer alignment between ODA and the Paris Agreement. Um, and really, you know, it needs to prioritise climate change and it needs to prioritise nature as well and I'll get onto that in a little bit um, shortly particularly in the context of the UK as um, the ongoing COP president and particularly off the back of the IPCC report, which, which really stresses that we have a closing window for climate action. Um, but really the two points I wanted to make actually pick up on a couple of points that um, both Thames and Anvel have already mentioned. I guess, you know, reflecting on what donors or climate finance providers need to do beyond just committing to alignment, I think one of the critical points here is looking at the role of intermediaries. Um, you know, these big international NGOs and other organisations that, that often are responsible for or, you know, largely deliver the development assistance from the UK and other donor countries. I think it's really important that um, we recognise that the UK's ability to align ODA with the Paris Agreement is often um, very closely connected to how these organisations deliver their support. And so um, I think what would be really fantastic is if the UK and perhaps other climate finance providing countries got together and looked at what expectations would be needed to um, ensure that these organisations do deliver on on this alignment. And I think as you open that door, I think that also um, lends itself quite nicely to having a conversation around what the role of these organizations are moving forward, um, particularly as there is a stronger push to move to more business unusual practices that take a more bottom up approach to designing some of these and implementing some of these actions. Um, and I think that's quite an important um, part of this story. Um, uh, and yeah, particularly looking at, at those roles um, is very critical. The second point I wanna make, um, is very much sort of looking at what climate finance would do to support alignment with um, ODA alignment to the Paris Agreement. Um, and this very much links to also the review from the International Development Committee last year. Um, and actually a lot of reports are starting to look at this right now, um, but really how you can structure, how you can leverage climate finance to support this alignment. And there are a number of ways that you can do that. The first is to look at how you can support and incubate innovation, how climate finance can really support that missing middle that we call, we use in, in IIED to look at how you can support local level um, and also local institutions, but also the national institutions as well, um, to adjust and test and trial what processes work in terms of bringing alignment to these issues, um, but also how you can build capabilities and trust as well. And so I think allowing or leveraging climate finance to support that will be really critical. Um, the other points I think really here are around really facilitating meaningful engagement with lower income countries and Indigenous peoples and local communities as well. Um, this is particularly important for ensuring that local context, local knowledge, local culture, traditional knowledge is embedded in the design and implementation. And this, of course, links closely to other issues that we work on a lot as an organisation around um, vertically, vertically integrating um, finance delivery mechanism so you've got that connection between the local up to the national regional and international so that you're able to feed the the knowledge and the um, expectations and the priorities of local communities up into the international system as well and the final point i'll make on this point we may have more time in the q a if we get there is um, that really climate finance needs to shift to providing much longer term much more patient and much more predictable financing and this is a call that comes through in um, you know, 
activities like the principles for locally led adaptation and other actors are calling for this as well, you know, shifting from much shorter term funding cycles of three to five years and really moving into a state of seven plus years. And I think that allows that innovation to happen, that local engagement to be much more meaningful, um, to build trust, to strengthen national and local institutions. And I think that in itself is really fundamental to um, aligning ODA to the Paris Agreement also. I'll stop there. Thanks very much indeed, Ebony. Um, we'll go out to questions shortly, but just before we do, Val, you in your introductory remarks, as Tamsin did as well, referred to um, the crisis around the Russian invasion of Ukraine and this being uh, obviously a massively important and consequential kind of geopolitical moment. Um, and you mentioned a way in which that could reinforce a focus on climate through obviously fossil fuel dependence and the ways in which, you know, um, that has fed into the origins of the conflict. Um, but there are also obviously clear links that it will distract attention, um, create also other priorities, even um, push certain geographies to the fore in the way that people think about aid. So I just wanted to come back to you on that in terms of the Paris Agreement. Um, how do you see this moment? And it, uh, to put it in a slightly more positive way, what can the community as a whole do to keep attention on the key elements of the Paris Agreement? But you don't ask the mm. <laughs> um, you easy questions. The uh, well, no, I mean, I, I, so first of all, I do think the point about energy is, is huge, right? We know the contribution yeah. energy makes to um, emissions, global emissions. So, um, uh, how how this moment is a catalyst for the you know common objective of, of mm. getting off fossil fuels I think is really important and should be the focus I think you know we also need to accept this is a crisis like none other I have mm. experienced in in my professional life um and we're still seeing that unfold and things are changing very quickly and could change and so it's quite hard to predict how it will all come out I think though you know I remember going into COP26 um we were very conscious of geopolitics as a risk to what we wanted to achieve at COP26. And at that time, it was a different set of geopolitical considerations. Um, and so I think going into COP27, you also have to kind of, we also have to be thinking through what this might mean for how, what we might be able to secure there and how different parties will come and want to work together or not. And so I think it's hard to predict what that will be, but we need to be thinking about it now, absolutely as a, as a risk factor to this agenda. Okay. Thanks very much, Val. Um, let me open it up firstly to questions in the room, and then we'll get questions from the online audience. Would anyone like to go first? Yes, please introduce yourself. Oh, hang on a minute. There's a, there's a microphone on its way. I, I didn't give uh, no, it's okay. enough time um, to get I'm to Francis. You. I'm from CAFOD. Um, obviously, in the next couple of days, we're hearing rumours that Liz Truss is going to in, announce a new international development strategy. There was a piece in the Telegraph, um, I think, last week, which suggested that that strategy will be moving away from climate. So it's really interesting uh, to hear what you were saying, because it seems like what you're outlining as priorities isn't quite what seems to be the priority that's potentially going to come out of this strategy. And I suppose I just wondered what you feel like that direction really means for the work that the UK government is doing, not only to tackle climate change here, but, you know, abroad. And obviously, as the CDC moves into BII, it's very clear that we're moving away from tackling global poverty towards kind of investment in what seems to be more middle-income countries, actually, than, you know, the standard low-income countries that we've seen before. So it would be good to get your, I suppose, I know you can't say it, but what's your thoughts about that direction and why at this critical moment, especially with the report that's just come out, that we would even consider a move like this? Thanks. So, um, thank you. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sort of at liberty to kind of say what the international development strategy is going to cover, of course, because it's not, not yet been sort of released. What I would say is, of course, the integrated review, which is the UK government's foreign policy kind of strategy, um, puts climate and biodiversity as the number one um, foreign um, international priority. 
uh, we of course are very publicly committed to doubling our international climate finance to 11.6 billion over the next um, five years. And of course, we are still the COP president uh, with a set of international obligations through to COP27. So, you know, there's a lot of building blocks here. It's not, you know, the international development strategy is one part of the government's articulation of its priorities. It's a very important part on the development side, but of course, the tools available to government are are very wide. So I would just, I mean, I would just, those are all um, the pillars of our approach and they're all there and they're all kind of very publicly um, articulated already. So I would sort of encourage you to, to look at those. Um, just on, on CDC BII, they have of course put out their own climate strategy, which is a very good one, I think. So um, uh, recognizing that they're going through this bigger change, the climate strategy is in place and it's a good one and it commits them to Paris alignment to 30% of their investments being kind of climate finance. Um, to yeah, to a whole suite of things. So yeah, those. So I think I think I'm relatively comfortable that there's a lot of foreign policy um, building blocks in place that will continue to reaffirm the importance of this agenda. Thanks very much, Val. Any other questions in the room? Yep, John. <laughs> I think we're all a bit out of practice on the mic's routine. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks, Andy. Um, I'm John Carstensen from uh, Mark McDonald. Um, the, the question I have, Bell, you, you mentioned the uh, admirable uh, increase in, uh, in funding uh, for climate efforts, but given the constraints on international development funding, it probably means that the climate finance will need to pursue multiple uh, objectives at the same time. So my question to you is uh, a mix of, up, are the upcoming FCDO programs sufficiently geared towards uh, that transformational change that Ebony was talking about um, when it still might have to balance uh, uh, some uh, more direct policy uh, achievements uh, in in order to achieve its its overall uh, outcome. Uh, so, very much around other programs geared uh, towards the uh, that longer term outcome. Uh, and secondly, could you say a bit about how important you think a mechanism under the um, climate convention to address loss and damage uh, will be uh, in the future. Um, thanks, John. Um, so on transformational, so I, I guess it, it depends how you define transformational, but if, you, if, if I think about them in terms of three different ways, one is recognizing our money is probably never gonna be enough. It, so investments that you make through ODA always need to leverage others, uh, whether that's private money, other donors, MTBs, domestic resources. Um, so absolutely. Uh, I mean, I don't see all the business cases, of course, because I don't control all of the money. Uh, ministers do that. But um, but a key principle has to be leverage and will be leverage of, of other people's resources. The other is whether you're trying to generate policy shifts, um, uh, ideally major policy shifts, whether that's on energy or land use or, or other areas. Um, so, I mean, one one program that is in my area is on the just rural transition. So, shifting, trying to encourage governments to shift their agricultural subsidies, so from less environmentally damaging ones to um, more positive ones. So, so using climate programming to try and shift policy, I think, is another transformational way. And then it's also the issues that you might want to focus on, I guess. So focusing on transformational issues. So, I mean, we made a lot of announcements at COP about different areas, whether that's forestry, uh, adaptation, um, subsector work. Um, so, yes, I absolutely think that. And, and of course, climate finance is a ring fence within the ODA budget, and it's defined it must contribute to the Paris goals. So, you know, although, of course, we want to try and achieve poverty impacts because it's also ODA um, and you want to achieve other things with it, it does have to meet the, the climate finance um, specifications. Um, loss and damage. So I have to be really careful here because um, of the negotiations context with, with loss and damage. But undoubtedly, I mean, I'm really proud of what the Glasgow Climate Pact achieved on loss and damage. It really moved that conversation forward. Um, we, of course, have there were two, two parts to it, right? There's a, a operationalizing the Santiago network, but then there's also 
the Glasgow Dialogue on Loss and Damage, which will start to, I hope, have a real world conversation about loss and damage, how it's impacting countries and the sorts of um, programming that can minimise, avert and address loss and damage. And, and that sort of real world conversation, if you like, about how as development professionals we think about loss and damage is a really important one that I'm really keen to engage with. Um, and recognising that Glasgow has given us the opportunity to have that conversation. And I think that's a really good thing. Thanks very much, Val. Um, let me put a question to Ebony at this point. Um, I mentioned that you work across the two COPs, across the biodiversity loss and the climate agenda. Um, we and There's uh, fairly full drafts out of the global biodiversity framework that's anticipated to be the main output from Kunming. What do you think um, action on biodiversity loss can take from this discussion? Do you think this is a good framing, coming aligned or whatever? Or um, do you think there are risks here as well? Uh, I think there's a lot that biodiversity can learn from this discussion. And in fact, for those who may also be closely tracking UNFCCC and CBD discussions, you will also agree that where biodiversity talks are at the moment is quite similar to where, where climate talks were ahead of the Paris Agreement COP. And so it's interesting to kind of see the similarities emerge through both discussions, although several years apart. Um, I think one of the things that the IK report points out quite clearly is that there is a fundamental shift towards aligning ODA to climate change. And I think a similar story will start to emerge for biodiversity as well. Um, when you look at the, the first draft of the global biodiversity framework, which again, many people say will be the Paris Agreement moment for um, biodiversity when it's hopefully agreed to later this year. Um, you know, there's a target in there, target 14, which seeks to, and I wrote it down because it was quite long. I won't read the whole thing out. Um, but it looks to ensure that parties fully integrate biodiversity into policies, programs, et cetera, and ensure that all activities and financial flows are aligned with biodiversity values. Now, that language will probably shift a little bit based on the negotiations going on in Geneva this week and last week. But nonetheless, this idea of alignment is absolutely embedded in the global biodiversity framework. And so I think, I think what is useful about the IK report and the movements that are happening in climate change to align, or rather for ODA to align to the climate priorities, will start to play out and paves the way really for the biodiversity discussions as well. Um, I do also think, if I can, if I can keep talking just for a moment longer, Andy, I think there is a lot to unpack around the linkages between um, climate and nature finance, and ideally bringing them together into climate nature finance. And this absolutely gets to your point, John, around co multiple co-benefits. Um, I think that at the moment there's a lot of a lot of talk and a lot of really exciting announcements. Um, but we need to really see this kind of play out in practical ways. We released some preliminary analysis last week or last month actually about um, looking at the extent to which climate adaptation projects from OECD countries going towards least developed countries can support also outcomes for nature. And at the moment, the data shows that only 10% of um, that funding for adaptation also supports outcomes for nature. And we were pretty shocked, I have to say, we thought it would be a little bit higher, particularly considering least developed countries, 45 of 46 of them have nature embedded in the NDC. So I think you would expect to see 10% not you know, be the figure, you would hope it would be quite a bit higher. Um, so there's a lot to unpack here, but I think the discussions that are going on at the moment around alignment of ODA to climate change are incredibly relevant to biodiversity. I think, uh, you know, we can really welcome a lot of these announcements, but I think we need to hold our celebrations until we really see this translating into action on the ground. Yeah, if I could just follow up really quickly, there's also, um, if you like, um, a perspective or a style of focus that focuses on Indigenous people's rights and local communities' rights rather than just, you know, areas of protected, um, protected areas or whatever. Do you think, what do you think needs to happen for that to find its way through in the right kind of way? into oh, the practice of aid agents. Yeah, I mean, we could we could um, spend a whole 75 minutes just on this question. Um, I think the discussions happening in Geneva at the moment will be really critical in the biodiversity context because it's such a hot topic at the moment. Um, uh, I think there's a lot that could be done. I think there needs to be, I mean, getting to my point about um, looking at vertical integration of delivery mechanisms, you know, making sure that um, there is the ability for Indigenous peoples and local communities to really bring their, their cultural awareness, their their traditional knowledge, their experience, their intergenerational experience to um, inform, design, implement um, climate finance, nature finance activities. I think that's really critical. I don't think that's necessarily strong enough in the global biodiversity framework draft at the moment. Maybe it'll get kicked a little bit further along in these discussions. Let's hope so. 
Thanks very much indeed. Okay, Ian, yes. And then Sam. And then I'll go to the virtual audience. Thanks, Andy. Um, it's Ian Mitchell from the Centre for Global Development. Um, so I guess I wanted to ask a question about um, um, impact and evidence of impact. I think um, you know, the climate finance is now a pretty dominant form of, of aid. You know, in globally, it's sort of a quarter of all flows. And in the UK, it will, it will certainly be that because it's been protected you know, through the cuts. Um, I guess it strikes me that when we've looked at this, you know, that the evidence, the hard evidence on impact, you know, the high quality evidence on impact is is pretty thin, actually. And I, I don't know whether Tamsin wants to comment on this from the, the aid impact of review point of perspective. But I guess if you look down the road in a couple of years, you could be in a position where, you know, a quarter or a third of the UK aid budget is being spent on, on climate and nature. Mm -hmm. I wonder what we know really about the impact of that money and, and, and the risks if, if, if it turns out well, that's not having the impact that we hope it does. And I'd be interested in uh, particularly Tam's interview on that. Maybe also that. Great, great question. Thanks very much, Ian. Should we take Sam's question as well? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Sam Vickersteth. Um, so the question for me seems to be um, alignment to public expenditure with the Paris Agreement and obviously the limitations about where ICAI can look at Tamsin you with ODA dispersed across a number of government departments, can you comment on leveraging that wider change of public expenditure beyond the, the area of, of, of ODA finance? Um, because that's the bigger question of what we have to shift. And I kind of felt as we went to the African Development Bank, we've got a broader influencing piece emerging. Um, can Vel and Tamsin talk about that wider leverage of change that we might hope to see here to be aligned to Paris, which is not a, an aid agreement, we need to remember. Okay. Thanks very much, Tamsin. Well, thank, thank you both for, um, you know, letting Vel off the hook for a moment, <laughs> give, <laughs> giving me a go. Um, so, so on the first point, Ian, as, as I mentioned, for this review, we did a rapid review and we recognised it was too early to look for impacts, but actually not long before we did a full review looking at UK aid to tackle deforestation and biodiversity loss. And there we deliberately looked at some programmes which had quite a long history behind them so that you would you know, expect to see some evidence of impact. And we did find some strong stories there uh, and, and some positive achievements of some of the major programmes like the Forest Markets and Governance Programme, which, which relating to the wider picture was an intervention in a trade context to tackle illegal logging. But in terms of the sort of rigour that I know CGD is known for, um, what we, we couldn't find in government was uh, sufficient rigour and, and a rigorous process on assessing what the impacts in those forest projects had actually been in terms of avoided deforestation, for example. So they didn't, they, they had some methods for assessing impact, but mostly they were too complicated to operationalise. So that didn't add up to the rigorous picture that, that you would want to see. So one of the areas we asked them to improve on was, was impact assessment. Uh, oh, but uh, so I think that's probably as much as I can say on on the related area. There's a definitely a road to run and experience to be gained from others' best practice on measuring impact. Uh, in answer to your question, Sam, I do struggle a bit because it isn't our remit to look beyond ODA. Um, the committee that we feed into has asked that we do broaden our remit beyond ODA for the sort of logical reason that there's quite a lot of finance which is blended uh, and, and that those boundaries don't sit neatly. Um, so in, in that forest review, for example, we only alluded in passing to areas of non-odor such as trade and you know the new legislation that was coming through because that, that isn't our remit. But remember, as I said at the beginning, this commitment came in as just part of that green finance picture which was about aligning all finance flows with the Paris Agreement. So there's a you know, much bigger picture that's happening, which we're looking at a, a smaller part. And I think as we see more and more blended finance, then inevitably ICAI's role will in effect, its scrutiny will have an impact on the non-ODA. 
Thanks very much, Tamsin. I think we have a question yeah. in from the online audience. Yeah, we have a nice challenging question from the online audience, um, which I hope can bring in our AFDB colleague, um, Al Hamdu, who's, who's still on the call, though right. we can't see him just now, but I think he'll pop on camera. Um, so Justine Mwanje asked, poverty is a cause and effect is both a cause and effect of resource degradation and climate change. Poverty is massive and increasing in much of Africa. Beyond the rhetoric, Justine would like to know how the UK and AFDB plan to solve this problem. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. My name is Alhamdu Dorsuma. I'm the Acting Director for Climate Change and Green Growth at the African Development Bank. And thanks for the question on poverty. Uh, it, as rightly mentioned, uh, poverty is uh, one of the biggest challenges that uh, Africa is facing. And that's actually the raison d'etre of uh, the creation of the African Development Bank to first address uh, poverty across the continent. But we all know that poverty is also uh, a major cause of um, environmental degradation in most of the African countries because people rely on on, on natural capital for their livelihoods. And this results in, in increased uh, degradation of the natural resources. And this also leads to uh, significant climate impacts. So there is a link between poverty, environment, and climate change in general. Uh, so uh, at the bank, one thing that we, we are doing is really mainstream uh, uh, our climate action also natural resource management as part of our development interventions. For instance, uh, for any project that we are currently designing, we are sure that uh, this beyond the poverty reduction uh, uh, effort, we need to make sure that those projects uh, are based on sustainability criteria uh, using various tools actually, um, not only the, the environment and the social safeguards tool, but also other tools to make sure that uh, uh, pover poverty reduction does not, efforts to reduce poverty does not uh, lead to significant climate impacts. And also ensure that climate impacts uh, we do not uh, produce more pover poverty, uh, poverty in Africa. So I think this is an area of, um, uh, of collaboration that I see um, uh, increasing uh, in, in the future. Uh, because uh, as, as uh, VP Kariuki mentioned, we have adopted our new uh, strategy and policy on climate change last year. And uh, the, the main objective of this uh, new framework is to address the two challenges at the same time. So that, so that uh, poverty eradication is addressed at the same time we, 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 we embed climate actions into our development interventions. Uh, given that um, we at the African Development Bank consider climate change as a cost-cutting issue that needs to be addressed across all of the sector interventions, be it in agriculture, water resource management, um, infrastructure, uh, etc. So we, 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 we believe that um, uh, the, uh, the new framework that we adopted last year for the next 10 years provides us with that um, necessary platform to work together with the UK and other uh, international development partners in order to achieve those challenge, two challenges at the same time, meaning uh, poverty reduction, but also um, reducing uh, the impact, climate impact that uh, most African countries are facing at the same time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alhamdu. Um, that's it, I think, with the online audience. Sorry? In, sorry, in, in Zoom, Paul Steele has a raised hand. Okay, good. Right. Access the yeah. Paul? Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for, uh, for an interesting webinar. I have a question, I suppose, both for uh, Mr. Ganendran and uh, Ms. Barton about um, broadening out beyond UK aid to seeing how the Paris alignment can be applied to UK foreign policy in general. I mean, we see the pressure uh, for, oil, for oil given the current crisis 
uh, and how that's um, affecting our climate goals. So I just wanted to see how we can we can you know take this uh, broader challenge of UK foreign policy and broader policy and Paris alignment. Over. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks very much. That was Paul Steele, IIED's chief economist, joining us online. Um, Val, any thoughts on that? Um, uh, so I, I think it's a very good question. I, I mean, I would say that some of that's already happening. The fossil fuel policy, for example, isn't just about ODA, it's about all UK international support. So it covers trade promotion. So whether our colleagues in posts can work, you know, how they promote or don't um, uh, the fossil fuel sector, it covers UK export finance. So the fossil fuel policy is already broader. And I would say, you know, going into COP, it wasn't just a, um, a development effort, that was an entire whole of government effort with the entire diplomatic network mobilized behind those set of objectives. And as, as Hamza was saying, through that process, we built a huge amount of understanding and capability within the global diplomatic and development network on these issues. So um, the, the question now is how we uh, sort of use that understanding, that enthusiasm, that set of priorities to really drive this agenda across, you know, the full um, suite of overseas operations. And I definitely think that's when we think when I think about Paris alignment, I don't just think about it in a narrow development kind of well not narrow but in just a development way i do think we, we kind of think about it across all of our international tools and some will move at different speeds um could i just sam your question mm. i mean it was a really good one about kind of um wider public finance um yeah it does absolutely and that's why i sort of made that connection so um if I'm honest, I think on, on the mitigation and net zero side, you're seeing more of that, partly because net zero is a whole of society, well, all of it's whole of society, but net zero, we're kind of clearer about some of the pathways, right? Transport, so Department of Transport are involved, buildings, buildings are involved, energy, you know. So, and then the Treasury has also asked for public investments to have a net zero kind of, you know, is this going to contribute to emissions reduction? So I think on that side, uh, more elements of public finance are being sort of aligned, but Paris alignment obviously has mitigation, adaptation and finance in Article 2, right? So, so on the adaptation side, I do think there's a bit more to go, how we integrate climate resilience and, and sort of that into all of public finance. I guess that's an area we should think about more. Um, and there's that's happening with the development of our new national adaptation plan, which is due to be released next year, I think. So a lot of that work on the adaptation pathways is now starting to happen. Thanks very much indeed, Val. Um, we're um, getting close to the end now, so if there aren't any more online questions, um, I'd like to ask Tamsin at this point, um, just for some reflections on the discussion, um, what more, what you think the priorities are, what more needs to be done in this area? Thanks very much, Andy, and I'm glad you've asked me that question, because I think Vel has provided more useful answers than I could have done to, to Paul and Sam, because of the, the rather boring limits on our remit, because although the committee wants us to do something, the government doesn't yet give us the remit and we won't stray from Whenever that. Whenever you say you only do I can sense <laughs> the frustration <laughs> in your voice, but we appreciate the limits of that. Uh, so, yeah, it, well, reflections now. I think I can be quite straightforward and in a way bring us back to the beginning of the discussion. Uh, was it Francis from Cafford? Uh, you were raising the international development strategy. So I think I may not have got through my key message on next steps. In fact, today we were hoping that the strategy would be you know, preferably out, if not to be absolutely imminent to the point where you might be able to say more about it. I think that you know, the thing we are looking for more than anything else is something that offers accountability. We heard from the African Development Bank all these dates by which they have milestones on the journey towards full Paris alignment. And the UK pressed them along with the other MDBs to say, when are you going to be Paris aligned? So we want to turn that back to the UK and hear a similar story in the new international development strategy. So our recommendation was that Paris alignment should be at the heart of the strategy uh, and that within that we'd have those milestones and that specificity and that roadmap. Uh, so that's what we're looking forward to seeing as soon as, as it possibly uh, can happen. We recognise absolutely the situation that you're in. I mean, a lot of decisions are being made very quickly every day. There needs to be the, the space, if you like, for a considered um, moment on how what's been happening in Ukraine affects the international development strategy. But what we are clearly expecting is that the commitments made in 2019 
will be fulfilled and that that will be done in an accountable way. And I hope that everybody listening today, whether in person or online, uh, will keep a, a beady eye on that, <laughs> keep the pressure up. Um, but it's been great to hear what the African Development Bank has been doing, you know, on its own account, uh, if you like, or under pressure from its shareholders and in response to its climate, its clients, uh, and not only in response to the UK's pressure. But uh, those are my reflections now. Many, many thanks to everybody um, for your coming to the event, for our wonderful hosts, uh, our great panellists. Uh, and I guess back to you, Andy, for the, the final word as the chair. Um, you can finish it off, but I, 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 I do, uh, you know, your expertise in bringing it back to the, the you know, lives on the front line, yeah. Indigenous people very much appreciated in this context. Yeah. Um, no, just huge thanks to you, Tamsin, for the initiative to have this. Um, huge thanks to Ebony for those really useful and valuable reflections. We'll all be hearing a lot more about CBD, I think, over the next year. Um, and the emphasis on that's really important. And something that's actually um, quite high profile within the UK government as well. Um, but particularly thank, particular thanks to you, Val. We appreciate this is a difficult moment to speak about a lot of these things, but we've really appreciated um, the openness and the clarity of your answers as well. So thank you very much indeed. Do you want to say anything else at this point, Val? Uh, no, just to, to thank um, Tamsin and the ICAI team. Uh, do hold us to account. You know, we've, we've put those things out in the public domain and it's, you know, do hold us to account for them. Um, and to you, Andy and Ebony, for um, hosting us. Yep. And Juliet Nam as well from our comms team. Huge thanks. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. I think we should be closing now. It's all 15. Thank you. Bye-bye.